very happy to welcome you today to the launch of our uh, first SDSN Europe report on the transformations for the joint implementation of the European Green Deal and the SDGs towards a green, digital, fair future for Europe. This is the first uh, report of SDSN Europe that has been launched uh, a few weeks ago. And uh, what we are trying to do here is uh, with uh, over 300 members and 13 national and regional networks of SDSN, uh, we are trying uh, to align the European recovery with Agenda 2030. This is our mission and we are leveraging the research within these uh, networks, but also as the SN work on the six transformations uh, to which I will be referring um, in the next uh, slides um, in order to play an active role in shaping a sustainable and resilient Europe, in shaping uh, the future that we want. So this is uh, the report, as I said before, on the transformations that are needed for the joint implementation of Agenda 2030 for sustainable development and the European Green Deal. And we are focusing on a green digital job-based inclusive recovery from COVID-19 pandemic. This is a report that was co-written uh, by the senior working group of uh, the SDSN network that focuses on the implementation of the European Green Deal. And our aim is to help this implementation and make this implementation consistent with the global agenda, the agenda, the UN agenda 2030. Participants in this team are president of UNSDSN, um, FIM, uh, Fondazione Eni Enrico Matei, and the uh, former um, CEO, uh, Paolo Carnevale, uh, the, uh, Carlo Papa, the chief uh, executive manager of Enel Foundation, uh, Laura Cosi uh, the, from the International Energy Agency, Mariana Machucato from Europe, uh, University College London, and Leonardo Pecetti from the University of Roma. I thank them all and I appreciate their contribution together with their teams. As you can see, many people have worked for a year for this report and we truly hope that it will be useful. The main messages of the report. First, we have a moral responsibility to build forward better, not back, forward better. COVID-19 pandemic related recovery packages are financed by national debt. So in effect, they are loans from future generations. So we ought to think about future generations when we are spending this money. And the good news is that we don't only have a moral responsibility, we have an economic case for building for better. Recent simulations of the effect of green recovery plans worldwide confirm that the green economic stimulus is more growth enhancing than a return to normal stimulus. And um, merely boosting current and sustainable consumption production partners will not help us recover economic growth. Fiscal stimulus that it is expected to book, boost aggregate demand, this crisis calls for transformative public investment. So this report connects four major policy initiatives, the SDGs, the European Green Deal, the uh, European semester process and the EU recovery plans. And what we try to do is connect them and provide the policymakers, the businesses, the financial institutions, uh, the civil society with actionable strategies that can guide a sustainable recovery. 
And of course, we have our policy framework, which is very helpful. We have a lot in our hands and we can move fast. We have the SDGs, as I said before, we have the European Green Deal, we have the new um, uh, 1.5 target for the ambition with regards to limiting global temperature. We have the six transformation pathways that have been launched in 2019 by UN SDSN. And these refer to transformations that need to be implemented in order to uh, be able to consistently and uh, consistently with the structure of governments be able to implement Agenda 2030. We need transformations in education, health, energy decarbonization, sustainable food, land, water, and oceans, sustainable cities and communities, and the digital revolution for sustainable development. And of course, this is uh, uh, mirrored in the European uh, Green Deal. The growth strategy of uh, Europe uh, with four main axes, become climate neutral by 2050, protect human life, animals and plants by cutting pollution, help companies become world leaders in clean products and technology technologies and leave no one behind. The European Green Deal is supported by the European Climate Law and the European Climate Pact, and it is also supported by a budget of almost one trillion, uh, which combines the EU budget and money to be leveraged by uh, uh, private and public partnerships. And of course, the whole European process is also guided by the European semester process, which is um, crucial to streamline with the policies of the European Green Deal and also with the SDGs. We know that in 2020, uh, we came up uh, with uh, the enhanced MFF and the EU next generation instrument in order to um, uh, help uh, recovery and uh, the recovery and resilience facility amounts to up to 672.5 billion to help uh, Europe um, uh, recover in a climate and digital um, mainstream uh, way. It is important that uh, the recovery and resilient uh, strategy is consistent with the European Green Deal. We did not leave, we did not forget about the sustainable growth strategy once we had this pandemic. This uh, 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 unprecedented uh, shock uh, did not um, make Europe uh, lose or diminish the ambition that we had. The uh, recovery and resilient uh, plan has to be spent with minimum 37% of climate related expenditure and each measure needs to respect the do no significant harm principle. And at the same time, 20% of it is digital related expenditure. This is important and this is um, a milestone for me, at least for me, for, the, um, for Europe as a whole. And the flagships uh, that govern these recovery and resilience plans are power up, renovate, recharge and refuel, connect, modernize, scale up, reskill and upskill. And uh, of course, we also have the uh, announcement by member state leaders just before the end of 2020 that we are increasing our ambition with regards to emissions to 55% reduction uh, by 2030, reduction compared uh, to 1919 uh, levels. So all this is there to help us mobilize the implementation of the European Green Deal and the SDGs. 
our approach tries to connect, as I said before, the SDGs, the European Green Deal and the European semester process. We start with a textual analysis of the European Green Deal and we cross map textually with regards to the used words, the European Green Deal policies and the SDGs. Then we use the UN Sustainable Development Report in order to identify country specific um, performance with regards to the SDGs. And we use the recommendations of the European semester process in order to cross map uh, the um, country specific recommendation and the SDGs. That is to answer the question, do the country specific recommendations derived from the semester process address the challenges that are identified uh, in the uh, sustainable development report address the challenges with regards to country specific SDG performance. Then we put uh, the cross mapping of the European Green Deal and SDGs and the SDR country specific challenges addressed by the country specific recommendation into a common framework in order to identify priority European Green Deal policies uh, for each and every country. And then we suggest transformation portfolios of in investments and policy reports for each and every country in order to meet these challenges. Uh, in, in, uh, then we uh, propose an assessment methodology, a multi-criteria, uh, inclusive, um, uh, interactive with the stakeholders assessment methodology for the different interventions in order to help us um, build the recovery and resilient plans in a very um, inclusive and uh, interactive uh, with stakeholders way and also distribute the available, available budget from the recovery and resilience plans. The good news is that the European Green Deal, the nine policies, protect biodiversity, farm to fork, sustainable agriculture, clean energy, sustainable industry, building and renovating, sustainable mobility, eliminating pollution, climate action, are, is mirror images of the 17 SDGs. In the dark, um, uh, spaces, dark green spaces, you uh, see where there is explicit reference in the European Green Deal text to SDG targets, and in the light green, you see implicit reference in European Green Deal text to SDGs target. You see that you have only a few wide places where there is no cross mapping. And this allows me to say that the SDGs and the European Green Deal are mirror images. We should understand this and we should not be um, uh, uh, thinking that we have two different agendas two different implementa possible implementation plans and that we are overwhelmed with uh, commitments, national commitments um, with regards to uh, the way forward, with regards to growth. Then we are bringing in, as I said before, the country specific recommendations of the semester process. Uh, these uh, recommendations are um, uh, address uh, fiscal policies supporting recovery and health, investment, green and digital transition, improved taxation, social policies, education and skills, finance and banking, public administration, labor market policies and others. And here I uh, showcase just three countries, Sweden, that uh, comes out as the best uh, uh, country with regards to performance um, against the SDGs. And you can see here that if you cross map the country specific recommendations uh, of uh, address to Sweden and um, with the SDG challenges, we see only 50% efficiency. So there is a room for increase address uh, an increase in uh, the effort for addressing the uh, SDG performance uh, 
uh, the effort um, um, invested in implementing the SDGs in the recommendations of the European semester process. The European semester process, uh, as far as Sweden is concerned, can better align with the SDGs challenges uh, uh, at a percentage 50 percent. Right. With the Germany, the percentage is 63%. So although Germany has uh, more significant challenges with regards to SDG performance, the country-specific recommendations directed to Germany are better aligned with um, the SDG performance. And another country, just because uh, it, it uh, comes from the heart, Greece, uh, the country I, I live in and, and work work uh, has an 80% alignment between SDG performance and country specific recommendation. Of course, among the three countries that I've shown here, we are uh, the worst, I would say, with regards to the implementation of the SDGs, which means we need to try more. You can see a detailed analysis of each and every of the 27 countries in the, rep in the report. Uh, with all the details uh, very well uh, articulated. Uh, with regards to general re uh, results is that country-specific recommendations efficiently address the challenges identified in the Sustainable Development Report and the implementation performance of the SDGs but there is still space for further alignment between country-specific recommendations and SDG. And this space is 30% um, um, uh, uh, um, uh, additional alignment is possible. Uh, also, it is quite interesting to see uh, the prioritization that derives from this uh, triple 3D cross mapping between European Green Deal, the SDGs and the country specific recommendations that allows us to derive the priority European Green Deal policies uh, for uh, each European country. For, more ca for most of the countries, the priority uh, policies are farm to fork, sustainable industry, elimination, elimination pollution, and climate action. The um, second part of the report focuses on technological and investment pathways and um, is based on a report uh, produced by a uh, theme on the uh, roadmap to 2050, to 2050, which uh, produces a manual for nations to decarbonize by 2050. We know that in order to achieve the increased emission reduction of 55%, we need an increase in investment of 350 billion per year. Uh, compared to previous decades, and we need help. Policymakers and other uh, stakeholders need help in order to prioritize and co design these investment pathways where to invest these 300. And 50 billion. And in our report, we specify that um, EU climate neutrality by 2050 implies a deep de transformation of power, industry, transport, and building sectors. And uh, we need uh, to construct explicit technology pathways regulated by po uh, sound policy framework. So with regards to power, we need a progressive phase out of traditional sources, a mix of renewable energy solutions. With regards to industry, we need to focus on hard to abate cements like uh, segments like cement, iron, steel, and petrochemicals. With regards to transport, we need to focus on roadways, railways, airways, and, and navigation. And with regards to building, we need to retrofit and uh, renovate. And of course, special focus in, the in our report is uh, placed on a circular economy action plan uh, that is supported by the European Circular Economy Stakeholder pra uh, Platform and uh, various types of nature-based solutions. The third section focuses on the role of sustainable patient finance for European recovery, and it uh, identifies um, uh, transformations for fiscal policy, the financial sector, and businesses. 
Uh, since the 1980s, uh, governments um, were supposed to intervene only for the purpose of fixing market failures. Now we are asking governments to make significant long-term investments to support a rapid recovery from the coronavirus shocks. Businesses, we know they do not invest unless they see an opportunity for growth. So turning mitigation into opportunities for investment and innovation is key. All that is said in this report is based on a UCL report that exactly focuses on how we need to transform the fiscal sector, the financial sector, and the business sector in order uh, to produce sustainable innovation. And the main claim is that we require patient long-term strategic finance. At the macro level, we need to reconceptualize financial stability and the mission of central banks to include climate and environmental degradation risk. And at the meso level, we need national public investment organizations to provide positive sources of long-term patient finance, which support sustainable investing. For example, the European Investment Bank and the European Investment Fund have the expertise and scale to set direction in deploying, in deploying equity type financial instruments complementary to loans and guarantees. And this is important for businesses that are increasingly in depth in the crisis. And uh, then NL Foundation comes in to further detail sustainable finance for financial institutions and um, for companies with regards to ESG criteria. What we are suggesting uh, here is that uh, at the moment, corporate lenders, investors, and analysts today deal with two separate and disconnected reporting systems, a financial system and an, environment, and an ESG uh, system, environmental social governance performance system. The result is, is that they have two different narratives, one telling how profitable a company is and the other uh, highlighting whether what the company does is good for the people and the planet. What we suggest here is that the, we should work on the possibility of a single hybrid measure system that combines social and environmental impact with standard measures of financial performance. And all this needs to uh, um, be integrated in the general EU taxonomy. This uh, classification system for sustainable economic activities which has been launched at the, in 2019. And recently the, um, the commission is working on translating uh, this system into financial rules. And it is important, the EU taxonomy is important because it creates a common language for investors and lenders and scales up private and public investments to finance the transition to climate neutral and green economy. And of course, we focus on measuring uh, the effect of sustainability transition on jobs and skills. And we also focus on equity considerations because the transition has to be a fair and inclusive and leave no one behind. Investments in line with the European Green Deal can lead to approximately 1 million new jobs in energy and energy related sectors by 2030. Short-term jobs concentrated in existing programs that can mobilize money quickly, and also long-term higher investments will be possible in the power sector projects and also manufacturing on new efficient and low carbon vehicles and industrial processes. We should know that more new, most new jobs created in Europe will be high, will be in highly skilled Polish uh, uh, positions. So we require substantial training, upskilling, and reskilling. And one third of new jobs will re require moderate retraining. Um, in addition to the creation of jobs, what is also crucial, and this is uh, again a contribution for uh, NL Foundation, whereas the 
jobs creation multipliers are contributions for the from the International Energy Agency. Uh, and the foundation studied the distributional effects of key EU climate policies until 2050 and identify a package of measures to mitigate the regressive effects. And these uh, are mainly distributing revenues through lump sum transfers, implementing targeted energy efficiency measures, long-term job retraining programs, and funding of subsidies for new low carbon technologies via general taxation. And combined mitigation policies like this can assure more equality and increase GDP and employment. So mitigating the negative social, social impacts of climate policies is essential to ensure a broad support for the energy transition and regressive effects can be fully offset with targeted policies. And the Gini coefficients are, are expected to be reduced in all regions of um, Europe and uh, mostly in Southern Europe, which is one of the uh, most difficult areas, more traveled areas. The seventh section of our report, and I'm very close to finishing, is uh, identify how we can move from strategic priorities to sector-specific policies, how we can co-design and implement country-specific recovery and resilience plans. And here we suggest SDG linked sustainability, multi-criteria assessments that are involving all the relevant stakeholders, the politicians, the policymakers, the businesses, the financial sector, the NGOs, the civil society, so as to achieve increased social ownership for the green transition and genuine stakeholder participation. This is a multi-criteria methodology that allows the politicians to move fast. Politicians need to move fast now, faster than they ever did. So we try to give them uh, solution frameworks for constructing the recovery plans. And we uh, identify uh, the um, environmental impact um, of each um, investment suggested in the recovery and resilience plan, how it can be measured and how it relates to the SDGs. And we do the same for economic and social impact with regards to economic multipliers produce uh, jobs, uh, skills produce, uh, energy security, research and innovation, and so on. And we uh, um, focus and make it our job that this comes out explicitly and loudly that we need a, a very uh, systemic transformation that uh, includes all the stakeholders. Uh, we need what we call systems innovation, which can be understood as a combination of systems thinking and the process of innovation so as to enable transformative change within complex systems. We need to enable transformative change that will allow the acceleration that we need in order to meet the 2030 goals. We have the technologies, we have the money, we need, we don't have the time, we need to move fast. So a return to normal economic stimulus is environmentally unsustainable and economically inferior to a green stimulus. We have a once in a generation opportunity to direct economic growth based on the European Green Deal and the SDGs, which luckily, but not uh, uh, by accident, by, uh, but by construction are the two sides of the same coin. And we should focus on transformations based on the SDGs and the European Green Deal for the transition to a green digital job-based and inclusive recovery from COVID. So this is a very rapid summary of uh, all uh, we had in this report, but what we will do now is call in the institutions that um, contributed uh, to this report to give us a bit more detail on different uh, sections and make uh, the recommendations of the report more explicit. For this reason, I would like uh, to uh, call uh, Filippo Desarim from FIM uh, to open his camera 
uh, then um, Martha McPherson from UCL, Carlo Baba from NL Foundation, and uh, Theodoros Zarakariadis from the Cyprus Institute and SDSN Europe. Uh, hello to uh, everybody. I'm uh, extremely happy to have you with us. And uh, I will start with uh, Filippo, uh, if you allow me, and uh, ask him to give us an overview of the roadmap to 2050 and uh, identify the key inputs uh, for, the for the drafting and uh, the applied methodology and the key messages delivered. What are our pathways to 2050 climate neutrality? Yes, Phoebe, thank you very much for giving me the floor and uh, good morning, good afternoon and good evening to everyone. Um, just a recap on, uh, on the report, uh, Fondazione Enrico Mattei and uh, UNSDSN partnered uh, in 2019 in a joint effort to investigate technology roadmaps for the transition to zero emission of four uh, sectors you already mentioned, power industry, transport and buildings. The key input was to provide a technical guide that could be intended as a compass for policymakers to design and foster the implementation of the carbonization pathways, relying on available technology. For this reason, we launched an international workshop attended by more than 70 experts uh, who discussed other solutions for sectoral decarbonization. And the, the workshop was followed by an extensive consultation among more than 100 experts. So the result of the effort is the report, the Roadmap to 2050 report, that is really a technical toolkit for policymakers for adoption and implementation of the carbonization pathways at all scales local, national, and uh, regional. Uh, we examine technologies, regulatory policies, economic measures to be implemented in the pathways. Uh, I just want to underline some points, not, not the results because you can find, them, but the, um, the approach, for instance. Uh, the report has a high aspirations. Uh, the analysis simultaneously addresses multiple objectives promoted policy instruments and technological solution that can be used across sectors, all the four sectors. So we have a systemic, inclusive and flexible approach. Uh, another focal point concerning the approach uh, uh, regards the interconnectivity of action towards any one or more of those objectives. We are convinced and still we are that uh, an action in one sector can be detrimental to another. Uh, where some combined efforts could amplify the cumulative effects and achieve multiple objects. So, uh, as you mentioned, flexible and systemic is uh, fundamental. Uh, at the base of the six pillars for decarbonization that we identified, there must be a common ground not to be taken for granted. Uh, in fact, uh, three more elements must be considered. The first is that development of comprehensive climate policy will depend on specific geographical and social context. Flexible and innovation regulatory frameworks are pivotal to address the challenge and substantial efforts must be made to allocate consistent investment in technological research and development. Uh, let me add uh, some, something more on uh, enablers uh, that we identified during the drafting of the roadmap. Uh, the first is cost competitiveness of technologies and their development that surely represent a cross-cutting enabler. Uh, the second one is fair competition that is enabler among all the sectors as difference in regulation and incentives between countries, regions, and even jurisdiction within the same countries can cause competitive distortion. Uh, decarbonizing the power sector represents the precondition, of course, to reach a full decarbonization of other segments due to the strong cross-sectoral interaction. Uh, lastly... Mm -hmm. Maximization mm -hmm. of uh, production of renewable energy is the uh, key uh, of the of the of the process. Of uh, course, yeah. uh, Filippo, I would like to because this is a report. The SDSN uh, Europe report is a very uh, case study driven report with multiple uh, examples of implementation, successful implementation of the methodologies and approaches. Uh, that we uh, we propose. 
And uh, FIM uh, presents a case study regarding the medium term impact of COVID-19 on Italian energy. Can you give us a quick snapshot of that as well? Yeah, sure. Very quick snapshot. Uh, we studied uh, a medium term impact of COVID on an Italian energy system, actually. Uh, the main object is to phase medium term, so let's say five, 10 years, in order to evaluate the potential impacts of uh, the pandemic on uh, energy system. Uh, the model is uh, based on variation of three main drivers. One is GDP evolution. Uh, then we have future green investment linked to the incentives provided by the European uh, Union. And the, finally, the role of user behavior and habits with regards to mobility choices, mostly. So I don't want to go too much uh, in of detail, course. but the point is that uh, preliminary results show a decrease of the emission in all the different scenarios. We have three different scenarios. Uh, accordingly with uh, uh, how far we go with this situation. Let's say that in the worst case scenario to 2030, we have a 10% decrease uh, versus the baseline scenario. Uh, decrease that is mainly due to the ind industry sector, it is uh, minus 22% and transport sector. Uh, the work is still in progress as it is the pandemic, unfortunately. But we have three preliminary yes. results that I can share. Economic resources dedicated to green investment, uh, again, uh, need to be monitored in order to ensure the use for the set target, so use well the money. Innovative and digital technologies are needed to support economic recovery. We learned this in, in the past year more and more. And as a regard of passenger transport, we have to limit the increase of private car, both with modal mobility, both with uh, uh, support active mobility with tangible policy measures. Uh, uh, so uh, three simple uh, results. Uh, the methodology may be applied uh, and replicable for any other European countries or for uh, European Union as a whole. Excellent. Thank you very much, Filippo. Thank you. Uh, Martha. Uh, Martha McPherson from uh, UCL, Head of Green Economy, Institute for Innovation and Public Person. Uh, Martha, what is the role of patient finance in the systemic transformation we present in this uh, report? Hi, Phoebe. Hi, everyone. Thank you. It's good to be here speaking with all of you. Um, so, yeah, I'll lay out a little bit of the thinking about the role of patient finance that we present in the report. This is the concept of long term, stable, risk welcoming finance, which is the characteristics of finance needed for sustainable innovation and sustainable investment. And this is a, a kind of part of a piece of work that we've been thinking about for a long time, the concept of patient finance, how this plays out in the public and the private spheres. But delivering this economic message of long termism of being patient is particularly difficult right now at the time of the kind of collision of green investment with the COVID crisis, which suddenly makes everyone want to go very, very fast, making investments quickly to prop up um, different parts of the economy that are suddenly in, in huge need of liquidity. So there's a real need to avoid only reacting to the kind of tyranny of the urgent, um, the magnitude of the crisis, the magnitude, the financial magnitude of the response that's being taken right now it means that actions, decision making actions really do need to be scrutinized as part of a long term consequence um, kind of timeline. These are multiple generation impacts, what's being invested in now will have, uh, you know, impacts 10 years, 15 years down the line. So the, the kind of patient finance work stream is built on IIPPs, the Institute for Innovation and Public Purposes work over the last three years, and that of our director, Mariana Mazzucato, for many years before this, before the Institute was kind of found, founded, and from what we call practice-based theorizing, working closely with government, with public organizations from around the world. And we start essentially in the report from the fact that economies, um, economic growth has a direction, um, as well as a rate. Um, it, that having a direction, uh, not just measuring how fast an economy is growing, but where it's going to, means that we have an inherent political choice of which direction. Um, and the pandemic has really shone a light on the need for governments around the world to actively consider that direction as it aims to build forward better, not just build back the same or build back worse. And these are all kind of concepts that are coming into view. And underlying that, uh, this concept that, that you need an economic direction is the fact that finance itself is not a neutral actor. Finance isn't just there to you know, fund and, and then see what happens afterwards. The char characteristics of finance, of financial actors, of vehicles and of methods affects the outcomes of investments made. So the type of finance you put in affects the positive or negative types of innovation you get out. And the private financial sector, um, due to how it's structured, often tends towards short-termist, quite risk-averse approaches, 
that often can result in uh, latter stage investment within the innovation chain. So taking on a relatively narrow portfolio of lower risk investments only once future returns are secure. So what we do in the paper is kind of explore this to some degree and then set out the store, not just for finance, but for the public financial ecosystem to build in this patient direction, uh, developing on work we've done to understand basically how this can be done within three different levels of financial institution that Phoebe outlined before. So mapping this out in a framework that's adapted to finance at macro level, at meso level and at micro level. All these different types of financial institution and player is, are in abundance in the European ecosystem. So I'll quickly explain the three. Um, and then we can talk about kind of where this actually happens. Um, so firstly, in the report, we set out, a, how do you set out a conducive macroeconomic framework for investment? And this is key. And this comes to the role of central banks of macroeconomic and macroprudential policy. And central banks have played an increasingly interventionist role since 2008 um, in our economies. Um, but actually this has not coincided necessarily with a hugely significant adjustment of their policies in support of financing growth in the direction of the, of the SDGs, for example, financing zero carbon transitions. But this is really kind of being exploded recently. There's been a lot of research and policy analysis by those inside central banks, by those advocating outside of central banks, um, for, for central banks to take on more of an interventionist role in this field, and a growing acceptance by people like Isabel Schnabel, Christine Lagarde, that the kind of market mirror or market neutrality role being played by central banks, just reflecting back the market, is not feasible or realistic as a remit for central banks in the kind of cl climate and COVID world that we see made up of market failures. Um, so that's kind of how we unpick what central banks should do. And you can see on the slide, we've, we've kind of done some advocating around this. Um, secondly, at what we call the meso level, so the interstitial level, what is the role of national public investment organizations? So including national investment banks, infrastructure banks, things that are being explored in the UK right now, um, national promotional banks, uh, regulators and so on to provide positive service sources of long-term patient finance. Um, and these are lots of new um, organizations like this and lots of long-term organizations like this are developing into a good place to start supporting or continue supporting sustainable investment. The mandates, and as we've described them at IIPP, the missions of financial institutions are already changing and shifting. So our recommendation is that we need to support and, and uh, kind of uh, enable these organizations to go further, to go faster, and to understand patient finance as linked both to climate and to COVID recovery and renewal. And then finally, we take a time, some time to explore at the micro level. So this is what firms are doing. We know that firms are suffering individually. We know that sectors are suffering individually within the COVID crisis. But we've also framed up how important it is that this is taken on at a systems level. And we recommend looking to industrial strategy, looking to innovation strategy at national and at EU level as a market framing device and a market shaping device in the direction of, of our big societal challenges that the SDGs recognise. And so we Excellent. investigate. Oh, sorry. Can I just finish my yeah. sentence quickly? Yes, please, please. Sure. We investigate the role of, um, of conditionalities at firm level and support firms to kind of take this journey themselves. And that's the kind of three levels that we get to. Yes. And in one minute, Martha, uh, give us one, uh, one case study, one yes. example of implementation, successful implementation. We have quite a few in the report. Absolutely, yeah. You can dive into the report for more, but the one that I'll share with you now is what you can see on the far left of the, of the slide being shown. Um, there's a the development of a new investment, uh, national investment bank in Scotland that's very much linked to the SDGs, that has the SDGs um, as their national performance uh, framework for the whole of Scotland. So over the past couple of years, Scotland has been designing and planning for a long term patient finance provision uh, vehicle or kind of institution. And we at IAPP worked closely uh, with uh, the First Minister and with the government to write the blueprint for this uh, Scottish National Investment Bank. And the missions that are underpinning this bank are around zero carbon economy, around place-based transition, um, and around demographic change. So setting out a, uh, an investment vehicle, investment institution, that really does take on these big missions. Um, and this was formally launched um, at the end of November last year. So it's very much on its early stages journey and it's definitely something to, to, to watch and follow. Um, as, it, as it develops. Thank you so much, Martha. It's really enlightening to see that things are changing and moving forward. Uh, now I have the uh, pleasure of uh, calling in Carlo Papa, uh, Managing Director of NL Foundation. And uh, basically I want to ask him about uh, sustainable finance. Uh, how that uh, should be framed for financial institutions and how 
ESG criteria for companies uh, should be um, uh, part of uh, a hybrid model which combines not just ESG criteria, but also the profitability in, in, of companies in one narrative. This was a very uh, clever, very useful idea that Enel Foundation uh, bro brought in the picture, and I think it will have a major impact. Carlo, please. So, Bibi, thank you very much, and thank you for all for spending this afternoon with us. And thanks for the question. As I think that uh, what is what we call hybrid metrics, it's uh, just a step of a journey that, as you correctly say, started uh, 20 years ago, where companies started to do the environmental assessment of their business. Now we are at a stage in which uh, those financial metrics and uh, ESG metrics at large uh, are living, uh, I mean, in a parallel world. Uh, and uh, the effort is to try to connect, uh, which is the value created from shareholder, as you all know, with the value that uh, we can define using the words of our good friends at Harvard, uh, the shared value for society in and around the company. So this journey is uh, just a journey and uh, we see good signal thanks to the taxonomy, thanks to the regulation for financial institution. But uh, if you wish me to share a little secret, we can say that the journey will be uh, completed once on the Bloomberg screen or any screen uh, that analysts, financial use, analysts use every day to allocate our money from pension funds, uh, our um, savings, uh, and in general, the money from uh, government. Uh, once we will have uh, ESG performance indications specifically on financial screen uh, on financial expert, that would be the end of the journey. So that would be the point in which we clearly realize that measuring the impact on people and planet uh, for ensuring a sustainable prosperity for all has reached this goal. So there will be, as you correctly say, one single narrative. And uh, as I say, we're seeing already uh, good signs. Uh, I mean, uh, we have company that are playing uh, very carefully and uh, walking the talk, uh, the sustainable finance game. There's another bunch of uh, companies that are just uh, enjoying a name tag. But uh, what is uh, releasing and more important is that we have seen uh, last year, 2020, despite the COVID crisis, ESG funds uh, investment growing uh, dramatically all over the world. So the direction is right. And I think we should not forget uh, uh, something that is like a gray corner at this very moment is not only for companies to use hybrid metrics to measure their impact on people and planet and prosperity, but it's also about government. And uh, uh, if uh, there is uh, anyone in the audience that want to take this offline, we have just uh, released, we are about to release a work for the Italian Export Agency in which we changed it for the first time um, since GDP was invented, uh, the way you measure risks and opportunity for countries. So as of today, there are no models out there that consider into the risks metrics, the climate change risks, uh, the wealth uh, distribution uh, must uh, to distribute wealth uh, in a very harmonious and uh, homogeneous way. And third, to considering the energy transition as an opportunity for moving uh, uh, you know, I had uh, in the climate fight and ensuring uh, a wealth distribution that is homogeneous. So again, it's a journey. I think we should all cooperate. And if, if there is anyone in your audience that wish to cooperate in bringing this forward, either a company level or a country level, we are more than happy to do so. Excellent. And do you want to give us a snapshot of the uh, equity considerations uh, analysis uh, that we incorporated in this uh, report, how we can make our, we can make our climate policies uh, progressive, uh, how we can mitigate the regressive effects, which is important for fairness and social cohesion. Definitely. Uh, uh, as you say, I mean, equity should be the compass uh, to address uh, all the activities that we do in the policy making and in the business. So allow me to, to steal the, the words of Italian Prime Minister yesterday when he presented the new government at the Senate and likely he got an all the votation right. He was saying, remind all of us that fiscal policy is just a part 
of, uh, of the tasks the government should take uh, or institution should take into consideration because there are also structural policy, i.e. pushing ahead with the innovation and education, for example, and there are financial policies so allow people to, to access capital and credit in a, in a good way. Finally, there is a sure monetary and fiscal policy that should facilitate investment and create demands. I think when we call about progressive and regressive, uh, we should forget for a moment, uh, you know, what we have learned at university. There is no white and dark, uh, white and black in, in what has been implemented as of today. So first of all, uh, it's not say that, that all the climate policy have a regressive effect uh, in uh, at large, uh, because there is a mix of progressive and regressive effect. The second things that we didn't learn at university, probably at least my, me, is uh, to measure the impact at large. So if you see, for example, the policy that are pushing for more renewable in the mix uh, or more sustainable mobility, most of the time uh, we see analysts not to considering the impact, the impact on health. And it's not only public health, we are talking about the impact on the health of Carlo or PB that should be taken in con into consideration. So should be seen, uh, I mean, uh, the, the, um, the entire pictures. And uh, so, I mean, it's clearly that if we look uh, at situation like energy efficiency measure and we push for more energy efficiency measure, we can have our policy become uh, more progressive. But I invite all of uh, our audience to look at measuring in a comprehensive way, which is the impact on real people of uh, real policy making. And then, uh, I mean, uh, as uh, a point of governance before finishing, uh, it's about, uh, you know, all these different policies, policy structural, financial, and monetary and fiscal should be seen as a, as a whole, as an entire thing. So otherwise we find uh, in institution very complex like the European Union or any government, uh, which uh, is governing our country, we see bits and pieces of policy that one times are called progressive, another regressive. But since, uh, I mean, uh, the citizens of Europe are one person, one family, we should look at the entire package in a very coherent and consistent way, having in mind that equality is not a theory. We have the Gini index, we have wealth distribution index that can precisely tell us uh, uh, how important uh, it's uh, uh, looking in an harmonic way at this policy. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Carlo. I'm, no I'm moving now to Theodoros um, Zachariadis uh, from Cyprus Institute and member of the Scientific Committee of European Environment Agency, as well as the SN Europe Management. Theo, in all crises, timing is critical. Post pandemic fiscal than anything past. Policymakers need a decision, so they need guidance to steer between health protection, economic relief, and climate resilience. Give us the framework, give us the multi criteria a framework which can enable them to make fast and correct decisions towards sustainability. Thank you, Phoebe. Good afternoon and good morning to everyone. Um, you are right. Uh, decision makers need to take decisions fast <coughs> right now. So they need to take fast decisions for health and economic relief and would appreciate practical guidance, both in the design of recovery packages and also in their assessment. Uh, what guides us to a large extent in the report um, which is reflected in the report that you have presented today, of course, is, uh, let me borrow a term from the European Environment Agency saying that we need to enable the transition to a sustainable Europe through trusted and actionable knowledge for informed decision-making. So these three terms um, are very important and one should not come to the cost of another. Timing is critical. It shouldn't take years to propose recovery packages that are perfect. <clears throat> so trusted knowledge should not come at a cost to actionable knowledge. <clears throat> so, so with regards to promote, proposing recovery packages, I strongly believe that in order to be useful to the policymakers, we need a balance between measures that are familiar to them and measures that are visionary and induce transformative spending and reforms, as you said in your presentation. 
if we focus on visionary reforms only, say zero waste in 10 years time, we risk missing the trust of policymakers as they may consider this as unrealistic in today's social circumstances. But if we stay at the measures that policymakers fully understand, then we may miss the opportunity to enable the green transition. And that's why we need a balance between uh, trusted and actionable knowledge. So we have to start from existing plans, for example, the national energy and climate plans that each EU member state has prepared, the national strategies for biodiversity or for waste uh, prevention and so on, because policymakers have worked on these plans and to a large extent have gained experience in what works and what not. This is an important ingredient of a recovery package, but it is not enough. Having gained the trust of policymakers, then we have to move forward and include measures, reforms, investments that are indeed transformative. For example, transformations in the agricultural food system, nature-based solutions, visionary approaches towards a circular economy, sustainable mobility beyond merely technological solutions such as electrification of the fleet. So that's about the designing of the packages and this is reflected in our uh, uh, approach. With regard now to assessing the individual investments and reforms, as you have shown in one of your slides, our report proposes a set of sustainability and resilience criteria, partly different for the short and the long term, against which policymakers can assess each proposed investment and reform of, an, of a package. Some of these criteria can be assessed through specialized economic or environmental models. However, informed decision making, the term that I used at the beginning, certainly needs models, but goes beyond them. It requires an active involvement of diverse stakeholders, trade unions, business representatives and associations, civil society organizations, each one with their own concerns, their own priorities, their own views of what works and what not, what is more equitable and what risks jeopardizing social cohesion. So we need an inclusive consultation process informed by expert knowledge and models, but not limited to this expert knowledge. And this needs to take place in the European context in the coming months to ensure that the recovery and resilience plans that will be agreed by member states and the European Commission can indeed have the transformative effect we desire for Europe's sustainability. Thank you, Theo. Very nicely said and explained. Thank you very much. I would like now to call uh, Leonardo Beschetti, uh, professor at the University of Rome, a member of our senior working group, just to quickly uh, present our um, uh, forthcoming work on uh, sustainable of finance under the umbrella of uh, the Italian uh, presidency uh, of uh, G20. Leo? Thank you, Phoebe. Hello to everyone. Uh, I'm happy to, to, be, to be with you. Uh, the point is that Italy is organizing the G20 this year as you may know, and uh, uh, the G20 is, is uh, prepared at the beginning with an issue note. The issue note is agreed among the 20 countries. And this, uh, we have two issue notes over climate and energy. And uh, in this issue, the issue note basically states that the state of art and uh, uh, proposes some outcomes that the G20 members uh, uh, commit to, to prepare as a final document. And uh, in this outcome uh, that we uh, prepared, that, that had been approved, uh, as you mentioned at the beginning, we have uh, several important items. First one is to share green finance best practice around the G20 countries in order to draft a book of best practice for communication and dissemination purposes. Then a very important problem of indicators, take stock of a grid metric, sustainability threshold, and fee for purpose indicators at G20 level, because now indicators will be crucial for several policies related to ecological transition. The third point is a G20 sustainable finance hub as a place to exchange mechanism and views and experiences at institutional and scientific level. Uh, and finally, uh, a very uh, important policy issue uh, looking at proposals to phase out harmful subsidies. 
uh, including the compensative measure. As we know, the real problem here is, is the yellow vest risk. I mean, what, what is the reaction of the losers? So it's very important to go around the, the world and to see how the different countries have tackled with, the, with this problem. So these are the four uh, main, uh, main items. And uh, I'm happy that uh, as a contact uh, person uh, uh, for Italy in the G20, as an expert in the team preparing it, that we can uh, involve uh, the group, uh, our group, to, uh, to give a contribution uh, to develop these items that in the end will be approved by, by, the, by the G20 members. As you know, these notes are important because they keep on uh, influencing also the future paths of policies. So I think it would be a fascinating uh, work to do together. Thank you very much, Leonardo. And this is part of the mission of the recently launched SDSN Europe. And to tell you a bit more about our, our ambition and future vision, uh, I would like uh, to call uh, Adolf Glocke Lange, uh, the uh, first co-chair of SDSN Europe and Professor Angelo Riccaponi, the second co-chair. I, I am the third, but we also have a very uh, powerful team. Maria Cortez Bush as vice president of SDSN Network, Simone Cressy, Elena Creed, Barbara Di Paola, Andrea Erak, Maria Lendudi, and Dominique, who are supporting this work. And of course, the networks and the 300 members in uh, Europe uh, that will be uh, supporting uh, the mission. Adolf? Yeah, thank you, Phoebe, so much for, uh, for the presentation of the report and all the other colleagues who contributed to the presentation and to the uh, report, in fact, and also for introducing our team of three. Uh, I think that was the first time uh, that you used an enumeration. So the, we are a joint team. <laughs> There's no, no number one. Um, well, I think this is really an important step uh, we are now taking uh, to move the engagement, the role of all the SDS and membership in Europe to a new level. We have been working closely on European topics uh, across Europe in our respective countries, also with Brussels over the last five, six years. We had significant meetings with uh, colleagues in Brussels. But we gained the feeling that there is a lot more potential to bring together in our group. So on the one hand, to, to uh, connect the research that is done from, the, from Cyprus to, to Ireland and from Helsinki to Lisbon. And uh, I think this is the first role of this network that we come to really Europe-wide initiative and, uh, and research projects. The second uh, I deem important is um, obviously to talk to Brussels and Strasbourg, to the European institutions, in a much more cohesive way, in a much more uh, explicit way and coordinated way. But the most important thing, in my view, is to work on European politics in our national capitals, in our own home countries, because the politics in Brussels are shaped by the governments of the member states. And the accountability of these governments, national governments to their citizens, to the civil society, to academia is crucial. And we need to challenge them on this. I can tell from, from Germany that there is little public debate on how Germany uh, behaves, so to speak, uh, and performs in Brussels. There are some discussions between uh, the usual suspects who do uh, European studies and European politics on a general level, but when it comes to specific topics, in particular sustainable development, the link between the sustainable development community and the European policies in a public debate is quite weak. And I think to link these different levels, I think we can make a huge contribution. Uh, Phoebe, you have now raised the topic and, and presented uh, the issue of, uh, of recovery, Green Deal and semester. And there are many of us who join you in this work. 
Angelo will follow up on another focus. I only like to mention without elaborating on it that um, I also think that the external dimension of Europe is quite crucial for the implementation of the Green Deal and the SDGs. We have to look into the spillover. That is one thing. But we also have to talk about co-transformation. There are many countries that are trapped in, in non-sustainable cooperation patterns with Europe. And there's change necessary on both sides. And that doesn't only relate to the poorer or middle income countries. That relates in the same way to countries like in North America, in Asia, or in Russia. And I close with this, and I'm looking forward to the discussion we are having. Thank you. Thank you very much, Adolf. It's uh, an honor working with you. Angelo, Professor Angelo, please. Yes, just only a few words to say that I'm very pleased to be part of this uh, initiative. Uh, uh, as it was said, as the SN Europe will uh, collect 330 universities, and the strength of universities, the strength of students which are following, who are following our courses will be very important in order to promote sustainable development and to implement policies that we were before mentioning. It was already said that uh, there will be thematic groups. So we will work also by thematic groups. In particular, one meeting will be held on March 11 at 3 p.m. Central Europe time and you are all invited to participate to it. It will be on sustainable agri-food systems and land use. So who is interested in that? In the next few days, we'll find a format to enroll in the website of SDSN Europe. On that occasion, we will uh, uh, show, we will illustrate what we are already doing as SDSN Europe at the EU level. We will uh, present the first comparison among national recovery and resi resilience plans that we have analyzed with reference to agri-food systems. We will uh, highlight the importance of farmers and companies in the transition to sustainable food systems, in particular presenting the project named Fixing the Business of Food, which we are running together with the Columbia University and with the Barilla Foundation, but also we will uh, show the so-called FABLE initiative, which is very important to build technical capacity and develop national pathways for sustainable land use and food systems. We will share a digital platform to valorize good practices in the field, and we will talk about teaching initiatives. So these are, this is the main, these are what we would like to discuss with you about sustainable food systems and land use. And of course, we are keen on receiving comments and to enlarge participation and to work together to this very important aim to contribute to more sustainable and resilient Europe. So I don't want to take time because we are running out of it. Thanks for participating today. Thanks to Phoebe and the wonderful report just illustrated. And thanks to the panelists for their thoughtful and uh, really exciting words. Phoebe. Back to you. Thank you very much, Angelo. Angelo is a very important figure in mobilizing uh, research, especially on water and food nexus in Europe. He is the initiator and uh, visionary uh, of the Prima initiative that brought uh, a significant amount of money for research on water and food in Southern Europe. And this is an important achievement and he is building on that to greater initiatives. And we are all thank you, uh, thankful for his amazing contribution. We've uh, reached our final uh, session, the final part of this uh, event. Uh, which um, hosts uh, Professor Jeffrey Sachs, the major uh, uh, visionary of our efforts, uh, this uh, person that uh, mobilizes the globe in order to implement uh, the sustainability transition and the SDGs. And he will be in conversation with uh, Peter Smith from the European Economic and Social Committee, 
Udo Bollmann, a member of the European Parliament, and Minister Ryan, the uh, Irish Minister of Environment, Climate, and Communication. Jeff, Peter, Udo, uh, Minister Ryan, the floor is yours. How should the European Parliament and civil society mobilize and accelerate the implementation of the European Green Deal in uh, consistent with the SDGs? BB, thank you very much. Uh, thanks uh, to uh, all the colleagues for wonderful presentations and for all of the important work underlying this report. And special thanks to all uh, our friends who have created the European Green Deal. It is uh, without question uh, the most comprehensive uh, organized uh, strategy in any part of the world to achieve sustainable development. And this multi-pillar approach on energy, circular economy, sustainable land use, uh, sustainable uh, farm practices, digital economy is uh, enormously impressive and enormously inspiring because it's having a huge impact, not only through Europe, but in other parts of the world as well, giving uh, both notice and guidance to the rest of the regions of the world to make uh, similar strategies. Uh, but my question is, can it be implemented? Uh, it's complex. It's very challenging. Uh, Europe is uh, complex uh, enough uh, with 27 uh, countries uh, each uh, implementing individually as well as together. This is a multi-pillar approach. Our topic is about uh, the engagement as well of civil society. Uh, and of course, uh, the representatives uh, in the European Parliament. Uh, so I'm thrilled that we have uh, three leaders of this effort to reflect on what comes next, how to manage such a complex process, uh, to manage uh, administratively, managerially, financially, and politically and socially. Uh, so I'd like to turn first to Peter, uh, Peter Schmidt of the European Economic and Social Committee. Uh, you are so deeply engaged in uh, all of uh, this effort and in bringing the economics, the social and environmental objectives together. Peter, uh, what should we do? And is Europe uh, going to be able to implement this agenda? Yeah, thank you very much, uh, much uh, Jeffrey, and thanks, Phoebe, and for um, organizing this meeting. I'm happy to join this meeting, and then hello. Uh, to everybody. I, th I mean, that's that's indeed a complex question, Jeffrey, when you ask me, uh, coming from the civil society. So we have been the first, uh, the first, as you mentioned, the first institution who called for a comprehensive food policy, who called for an overarching strategy in the implementing of the SDG and so on and so on. So that means content-wise, the ESC is ready to join. And uh, the problem is, and in this morning, uh, we had in our ESC a meeting uh, of our semester group, and uh, Phoebe mentioned uh, how important it is that we go through the semester, uh, the European semester, and try to implement the, the, uh, the sustainable, uh, sustainable development, let me call it like that. Um, and our, we, we made a survey before, um, asked our members, um, what is the participation of civil society in the implementation of the recovery plans? So, and give you a short and quick answer to that, it is, it, is, it is weak. It is absolutely weak. And that's the problem. And Adolf mentioned it, that it, is, it would be so important that we must go to our national uh, governments and talk to them uh, what is necessary from the point of civil society, this view. So what is for our point of view necessary is, as I said, we must have an and, and structured involvement on all levels from the civil society. So we had once the multi-level uh, um, um, stakeholder platform, so where we, we, we have been part. So this is, this is gone. So why the commission doesn't, doesn't uh, follow up, have the follow up of this, of this platform, where they could gather the, the civil society's views. This is one very important point. The other very important point is, I think we must discuss quite deeply the question of, of the growth and coming to a well-being economy. 
rather than just say we have, must keep our growth, we must really discuss that what we heard today. So third point is having a deep view on the social aspect. We heard that uh, several times today, but my point of view is, and our point of view is we have to challenge also the distribution aspect in our society. So uh, Phoebe mentioned this uh, before, money is there. In our point of view, it is wrong. It is wrongly distributed, and that's the that's the big problem. Give you an example. Um, we heard right now that there is a, it should be a debate on sustainable food systems or on an agri food system. So, looking at this in the in the CIP, in the Common Agriculture Policy, we spent 60 billion euros in order to mitigate the situation of the farmers. Fair enough. So I don't challenge this. But, and this is the problem. What we have to to do. At the same time, the multinationals in the food supply chain, they make the big money. So that means while the taxpayer pays 60 billion per year, at the same time, we do not ask or challenge and say, look, multinationals have 20% profit on the turnover. So this is the question also what we have, I think, to discuss within this implementation in this implementation uh, the process. So to conclude, uh, we are ready as civil society to be part of this in all, on all the levels. Employers are ready, I know. Uh, the trade unions are ready. Uh, the, the NGOs are ready for a long time to, to, to be part of that. What we need is we must have structured involvement on the European and on the national level. That's for the first uh, moment from my side. Thank you, Peter. Very clear and very clear message from civil society. So uh, it, it's uh, uh, perfect to, to turn to our friend uh, Udo Bollmann, a uh, member of uh, the European Parliament uh, of the Social Demo Democratic Party of Germany and the Party of European Socialists, to talk about the role of uh, the European Parliament in uh, structuring, overseeing uh, this uh, European Green Deal and uh, Udo, the role of civil society in this process. I hope Udo is here. Yeah, there. There you are. You can see me, Jeff? Now we see you and hear you, absolutely. Oh, perfect. And good to uh, see you. Hello, everybody from uh, Brussels. Uh, forgive me that I was not uh, able to follow uh, the discussions earlier because I was in a, in a different meeting, another meeting. So um, Udo, forgive me if I... Udo, maybe I could just, uh, uh, if I'm not sure when you joined, but uh, we went through for the, the first uh, part of the program, all of the pillars of the European Green Deal, the different components, the country level actions, I pose the question about its complexity. Uh, can this be managed? Uh, and uh, oh, okay, yes. I get it. Yeah. So uh, let me add immediately on Peter that I totally agree uh, that civil society is an asset for the sustainability strategy, and that we have to do everything from the local to the global to involve uh, uh, civil society actors that push the agenda forward. Having said that, I would uh, say uh, it's not a joke, but it's, it's funny. The best news for the uh, sustainability supporters in these days is coming from Rome uh, with the news that our friend uh, Enrico Giovannini has taken over uh, the Ministry for Infrastructure in Italy. He is in command of a, a huge uh, network, one of the best networks in the world to promote the SDGs. And I'm uh, pretty sure that uh, uh, Enrico, uh, under uh, the leadership of uh, uh, Draghi, will be an asset uh, to our community and will do everything to push uh, for uh, implementation. Uh, when you ask the parliamentarian uh, how far are we and what can we do, I have to start uh, with language. Because there is a danger. I know the Green Deal is extremely important and I know the dimension, the international uh, dimension of the agenda of the Green Deal. 
but there is a certain danger in the language of uh, the European community that the SDGs as the central paradigm are replaced by the Green Deal, by the notion of the Green Deal, which is not a positive, which is a negative trend. And we have to beware of that. And we have to hinder that from, from coming into existence. Why? The Green Deal is an excellent tool, but the Green Deal is not the holistic program. The holistic program is the 2030 agenda. In the Green Deal, as it was presented by the Commission, there is no uh, gender, for instance. There is not enough social dimension. Uh, but it's not only about uh, uh, these uh, elements, it's about the basic idea of the transformation that we need. If we start from the awareness of the three big crises, we have health, we have climate, and we have the ongoing recession as a result of that. If we have to fear one thing, then this is growing inequalities on the globe amongst, as well as within societies. And growing inequalities will hinder us from achieving our goals. And what we need is quite the opposite, is empowerment of our societies, is empowerment of not only the urban, also the rural areas, is the empowerment of women and girls to come forward with their own ideas for their personal lives in peace and in friendship with the environment. Not only to uh, reboost, but rebuild uh, what we have to do and use the energy that, that is internationally now spent into the idea to overcome the crisis, also to get new ground, get new uh, ideas of socio-ecological transformation. This is the decisive task. And therefore, I tend to permanently speak of the Green Deal as one tool in the agenda of 2030, only as one tool, because we need all the other elements as well. And in this interpretation, it is a major useful uh, chapter we could open and how could we do that? Um, of course, uh, the language of the European Commission became more and more sustainable. When Ursula von der Leyen set out the portfolios for the commissioners, when she uh, set out the political guidelines, it's full of positive language about the SDGs. What is lacking is elaboration, implementation, when it comes to hardcore policies. And here we have to get better by use of the strength of parliaments, by use of the strength of civil society. We try to uh, improve um, the margins, the benchmarks in the financial programs. In the seven year uh, term uh, financial uh, MFF, it's the central program uh, of the European budget, forward planning for seven years, and we try to do that in the recovery fund, recovery program, which is extremely difficult because the member states uh, tend to do what they want in the recovery uh, program, even more than in the central budget of uh, the European Union. Secondly, we can, we can use and we should use all legislative capacities we have. Uh, it starts with trade. Let me uh, talk about trade, because trade is one of the decisive uh, areas where the European Union can turn the negative spillover in the interrelation with the rest of the world into the positive spillover. There is no uh, necessity uh, that we uh, export old-fashioned cars to Latin America or wherever. We can also export and produce in Latin America uh, modern uh, infrastructure for mobility, which is environmentally friendly. And many, many other uh, examples could be given. The same is true for the legislation on development aid. We have to benchmark uh, and use the um, inequality category as a decisive landmark for the improvement of our policies. 
Why not asking, for instance, um, in trade as well as in development aid, do we really serve the lower 40% of the population if we are engaging in trade agreements and development agenda policies? Or do we only speak about greening and we are increasing the inequalities? I fully take on board uh, what uh, Peter already said about the, the uh, distinction between uh, GDP counting and the well being uh, economy for all. That has to be, the latter has to be our benchmark. And we, we have to extensively make use of analytical instruments. We demand from the Commission, for instance, ex post as uh, well as ex ante analysis. Uh, what really is the impact about what we are doing uh, in the global world. Uh, the health crisis, uh, uh, last but not least, uh, is a typical example uh, that Europe came late and is very much looking only inward uh, to analyze the inward problems. Um, we have not really adopted a global strategy, unlike Antonio Guterres yesterday rightly demanded, um, by saying we need a, a master plan for the globe. We, we do not need national uh, or only regional strategies. There is a huge danger that the rich countries of the North monopolize uh, the vaccination production. My political family, uh, the Social Democrats have started uh, a, a worldwide campaign in, in, within the Progressive Alliance to demand a global strategy that is fair to the global south and helpful immediately because otherwise we are going to lose the deadly race against uh, mutations. So wherever you go, whether that is health policy, agriculture, whether that is trade, whether that is development, we have to fight the agenda in the mindset as well in the structure of the programs and collect actors for more and more getting horizontal in our concrete policy uh, set, uh, that is the way ahead. Thank you. Udo, thank you. Very, That's very, very clear, uh, very consistent, uh, also with the Peter Schmidt's uh, comments about the vital need to integrate the social dimensions uh, fully into the European Green Deal. And uh, definitely our work at uh, the Sustainable Development Solutions Network and our report, uh, as uh, Phoebe Condori uh, laid out at the beginning of this session is to show that this is part of the overall SDG agenda, just like you said. Uh, it's a core tool. It is not a replacement agenda. Uh, and uh, I really thank you for that point. And we will make sure that we take that on uh, always uh, fully in, in our own work uh, together with the European Parliament and, and uh, European institutions. Our third panelist, I'm delighted to say, is uh, uh, Minister uh, Eamon uh, uh, Ryan, who is the Minister for Environment, Climate and Communications uh, of uh, Ireland. Uh, Minister, thank you very much for being with us. You have the responsibility to implement uh, this agenda uh, and a very complex one as we've been discussing. Could you give us your perspective uh, first on uh, Ireland's uh, challenge in implementing the European Green Deal as part of the SDGs and also how you see the European wide processes working. Uh, so, uh, Minister, if you could join now. Uh, good to see you. Thank, and thank you. Thank, thank you, Jeff. You. I hope you can hear me well as well. And, and uh, um, can I maybe come from the European perspective first, because I, I, I'm on the Council of Ministers and, and uh, that is an important place. It is an important place where we coordinate. To go back to you asked that question, how do 27 countries manage this coordination? And I would add, and I would say this as an Irishman, we also have to bring the British with us. You yeah. know, they they haven't sailed off into the Atlantic. They're still oh, yeah. stuck on the Teutonic, <laughs> they're still stuck on the Teutonic plate that is the continent of Europe that we're we're two islands off it, but but we will have to make sure we still cooperate um with britain even though they're not a member of the european union um and i think the council of ministers give a sense of hope i, I get a sense on I'm, I'm on four of the councils as it happens uh, but the energy and the environment ones are two in particular with responsibility in this area and i get a sense there is leadership there is 
there is it's just shaping up, it seems to me, so we, we could have across political perspectives. This, this has to work. It has to involve everyone. It, it, every place matters. And in my mind, the politics of that then is not the politics of division. It, it's the politics of cooperation and collaboration. And in the European Council, I would say that has to be collaboration east-west. You know, we haven't been good at that maybe in our union and we need to improve that. And need to be a real understanding that this is to the benefit of the, of the eastern part of Europe as well as the western. I would also, just to back up what Udo says, we cannot look this as fortress Europe either. We have to, in my mind, particularly in the run up to the likes of COP26 this November, we have to engage with the, the developing countries so that there's a real program for system change that allows them rise on the back of this Green Deal. And, and so we, we, we will, yes, we have to look at this as a European project, but Europe within the global diplomacy needs to act in support of climate adaptation and resilience and climate justice, particularly in the run up to COP26 in my mind. But also then we need to bring it home. Um, local. The environmental movement has learned a lesson, I think. We've made mistakes in the last 30, 40 years. We made too much mistakes saying it was part personal responsibility. You know, if you change your light bulb, we can save the planet. And people, they didn't buy it as a, the, the, it was too much putting responsibility on individuals. So as we as governments have to, have to take a role. But at the same time, what we're looking on is not putting all the emphasis on individual responsibility, but we need individual engagement of our citizens. Because in truth, if we're to make the change in, in uh, just take climate, in, in improving our homes, energy efficiency, we have to have the homeowner with us involved. If we're changing the transport system, which we need to do, that's not done easily, unless you have the community buying into the changes we need to make. If we're to do nature-based solutions to restore biodiversity as well as tackle climate, we need every farmer as the front line on our side. So I think on that, um, a few things. So as governments, we need to work at that council ministers level and that international diplomacy level, but we need to bring it back home. And we start by listening to people and asking for help rather than telling people what to do. Admitting that there are some uncertainties in this as the technology evolves, we learn by doing. Having patience, we need, I remember at a meeting once someone said, we need the same patience that those people who built the great European cathedrals. You know, when you laid the first stone, knowing that it would be your grandchildren might only put the top to the spire. We need a similar long-term commitment to this change. And we need to change our language and our, I agree with Udo, was he saying on that as well, it is, it's a language that has to speak to the heart as well as the head and speak to certain values that raise your spirits, not just your wallet. And um, so that's no small thing of all, everything we have to do. Maybe just from an Irish perspective, God, we're the world's worst sinners when it comes to looking after our environment. And, but maybe as prodigal son who returns or daughter, uh, having kind of seen the light of our, our errant ways and we start taking action on this, which we are, maybe that's a, uh, something that will be welcome as, a, as a, and each of us showing and sharing best knowledge, how do we, how are we going to do this and show that it is possible, we can, we can achieve these sustainable development goals in, in all their assets, in all their facets, in their social as well as their environmental and economic guise. Thank you, Minister. Could I ask you, uh... What is the basic uh, strategy for decarbonizing uh, in Ireland? How, what, how do you see the challenges and what kind of energy sources uh, do you think will be turn out? Will it be wind power or uh, what, what uh, will be the, the main approach, uh, do you think, technologically? It'll be collaboration, actually, because to make it work in my mind, you need, you can't just do it on your own country. It will be renewable. In Ireland's case, it'll be wind and solar. Um, but to make that work, we need to connect with our neighbors. It will only actually work on a Northwest European regional model because in that way you can balance the power. Yep. Uh, as the weather fronts come in over the Atlantic and we face the front of them on the, on the coast, of, on the edge of the Atlantic, we need to share and interconnect these new high voltage direct current cables which can carry power over a long distance with very little losses. 
that will allow us the real the center of this revolution and it is a revolution for the better in energy is the balance between variable supply and variable demand and that's both at the distribution grid where electric vehicles and heat pumps and all the power systems are turning on and off to balance that variable power and similarly at the transmission level that you have interconnection with neighboring countries it's one of the reasons i mentioned my british colleagues because they would still be have to be part of that that network, that, that connected network. So I think that is, that it's offshore, in my mind, for Ireland anyway, because our sea area is 10 times our land area, it'll be floating offshore wind at scale beyond compare, beyond anything we've ever seen before. And it'll be transported either via hydrogen or via high voltage direct current cables. And, and it, when we really think big about this, we'll, we'll start in the next decade. And then the next decade after that, this is the cathedral building, um, we will connect to the solar south and we will connect to hydro from the north and from the Alps and we will connect it to hyper energy efficiency. First thing rule, if you're filling a bath and put the plug in, so efficiency first. Uh, and it's, it will work because it's a better system. It's a better uh, economy. It is, these renewables are available everywhere, uh, be that geothermal or be it wind or be it solar or be it biomass. Um, careful with biomass because we have to look after biodiversity as well as climate. You can't just focus on the climate perspective alone. Um, but, but it's utterly doable. It's more stable. It gives security. In what I was saying there about North-South, that sharing of power with Solar South is going to lead to a much better, stronger relationship between Europe and North Africa and, and, the, and the rest of the African continent, in my mind. And it's also better east-west. We're, 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 we, we, it brings us away from the security fears that have surrounded energy for the past five, six decades. So yeah, I think it's renewable. It's all about the grid and it's efficiency first. I think, by the way, if I may say, uh, <laughs> that is a great vision. Uh, absolutely, uh, in, in my view, exactly what I, I would like to hear. And my question, uh, because I've always... Uh, worried about it, frankly, is, you know, I think that this idea that it has to be European scale and even beyond Europe to North Africa, the Eastern Mediterranean and so on, uh, can Europe actually coordinate enough and cooperate enough on the actual investments to get that completely transnational vision implemented? Because if you do that, it's going to work. Yeah, I don't see any reason why not. I go back to what I said about the Council of Ministers. Now, I was on it 10 years ago uh, as Energy Minister, and we signed our first North Seas Offshore Grid Initiative then. Now, for the 10 years we lost, we, we, did, we became fixated on the competitive advantages of frack gas, and we kind of spent our time worrying about that. But now, I think once transformed in the last five years... Huh? I say that was a, a distraction for us too in the United States, as you know. Yeah, no, it sure was. And um, but the advantage is the auction systems that European countries have set up, as an example, the British and the Dutch and the Danes and Germans and so on, on offshore wind have de-risked. These are all really large capital projects. Like these, these turbines are not small. They're Eiffel Tower size, and and they're floating in a rough sea. Like it's tough. So to make that work, you need to de-risk the planning and, 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 the, and the financing and, and the grid connection and all the kind of the boring but critical stuff so that you can bring down the cost because the biggest cost is around uncertainty and, and, and the biggest risk on that is around government planning and other actions. So what we've seen in Europe is, is that that has happened. We, we, we brought the cost right down of offshore wind and solar. Um, so the next step is this international collaboration, and that's always difficult because every energy minister likes to shuffle around on his own map of his own, his or her own country. Oh, I'm doing this here and I'm doing that there. But I think the Union and I think the Commission and I know the German and French and Spanish and British governments, including our own and Dutch and Danes in this. I'm talking about my own backyard now, Northwest Europe. Yep. I think we understand that it'll only work in collaboration. And it is all about the, those interconnectors reduce the amount of base loads you have to have as spinning reserve backup. So it is, it's, it's much more efficient. It requires trust. It requires trust that if the lights, if it risks the lights going off, that actually we have our neighbor who will be able to turn to. 
And that's the question. Can we get that trust? I think we can. I think because Europe has gone for this. So like Ursula von der Leyen, and fair play to her, she, she put the cards on the table. It's the European Green Deal. This is our game plan. And I don't hear anyone disagreeing. I don't see any political party saying that isn't the clever way to go. So that gives me a certain sense because you can't do stop start on this. This has to survive three or four commissions. It has to survive four or five national elections. <laughs> but, but there is that sense. This belongs to everyone as an idea. And that's what will make it work. Excellent. Thank you very, very much. Actually, I do want to ask one more thing. Can EIB play an important role as a European-wide institution to help to provide that European-wide uh, risk uh, de-risking and so forth? They are already, yeah. and uh, and they're they're actually been world leading. Can I give a shout out to a young Irishman, Andrew McDowell? He was head of renewables energy investment in, in uh, lending in, in EIB. He was vice president in the outgoing EIB. He changed the rules so that Europe would no longer, EIB would no longer invest in fossil. That's the way to go. Yeah. Like I, I said, we made a mistake in the environmental movement that we we're putting all the blame on the individual responsibility. Well, things changed in the last five years. We learned that actually you stop the problem at source, you divest at source. So we stopped offshore, offshore oil and gas exploration. We stopped fracking in our island. It's not easy, but, but we, we're st stopping burning coal. The EIB have got it as well. We stop investing in fossils. They've committed to that. That then turns the tap onto renewables. And that's where the financial markets are going. That's where, that's, listen, if you're not in that track, goodbye. You're missing the big, the big picture of what's happening in the world. Excellent. Thank you very much. We're taking very careful notes. Uh, that's a lot of wisdom. And uh, we wish you uh, all success. And of course, uh, this uh, Sustainable Development Solutions Network for Europe is uh, there to work together with you, universities across Europe, uh, academics. We want to make sure that uh, this works. And uh, we're really committed to that. And you're, you've given us a lot of encouragement, Minister. So uh, thank, thanks for your leadership in this. Really appreciate it. Wonderful. We have uh, thank you to uh, all of our uh, panel, to Peter Schmidt, to Udo Bullman, uh, to uh, Minister Ryan. Uh, we're at the end of uh, the time. I'm going to turn it back to uh, the uh, co-leader of uh, SDSN Europe and uh, the chair of this process, uh, Phoebe. Uh, thank you so much. And uh, back over to you. Thank you so much. Thank you for inspiring all of us uh, towards this uh, uh, belief that we can help transform the world towards a sustainable place for our children and, and, and their children. I want to thank the speakers, the co-authors of the report, the members of the senior working group, the SDSN Europe co-chairs and managers, uh, we didn't take uh, questions from the audience because we did not uh, have time, but I've answered all the questions and I am sure uh, if uh, my answers are not clear enough, write back to me and I will direct you to the relevant people. The slides and videos will be sent in a follow-up email. And I want to close by saying, we feel this is a once in a century opportunity to steer economic growth towards sustainability, uh, sustainability that respects profitability, the environment and the society. So let's join forces to um, mobilize uh, all we have uh, to achieve this goal. Thank you all for uh, making the time to be with us. Thank you.